I made my first trip to Yellowstone National Park in Wyoming in the summer of 2016. And I had no idea what I was getting into besides Old Faithful and Bison, but a friend had insisted I needed to see the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. So my friend who was doing a road trip to Seattle with me and I stopped to see this Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone and noticed a spot called Inspiration Point, which sounded pretty promising. So we went to Inspiration Point and we were captivated by a gorgeous view, one of the most beautiful sights I've ever seen. A waterfall cascaded down a cliff face, the river carved its way between walls of rock. I was mesmerized and blown away. My first visit to Yellowstone blew me away. It was an incredible trip. Three and a half months later, I made my second visit to Yellowstone. My father came along with me on my road trip back from Seattle, and this time, when we went to Yellowstone, I knew we had to go back to Inspiration Point. So I took him there, ready to blow him away with the same view, until I found out Inspiration Point was closed for construction. How can you close Inspiration Point for construction? We had to turn around from my favorite site of the trip, and though we saw almost all the same things as the first time I went to Yellowstone, though everything else about the trip was almost the exact same, from that visit I came away disappointed. One visit blew me away, the next visit disappointed me. What was the difference between the two that were almost the same? It can be summarized in one word. Expectation. I'll quote that great theologian William Shakespeare again because a quote is attributed to him saying that expectation is the root of all heartache. And sure enough, many of us have experienced that. Expectation, or more specifically, unmet expectation, is what crushes our expectations. It's what disappoints our expectations when they are not met. You expect a vacation is going to be restorative, enjoyable for your family, and then somebody gets the stomach bug. You expect the person you're marrying is the perfect person they've displayed themselves to be, and then they end up being a broken human being just like you. I didn't sign up for that. You have a child that seems to be an angel, and then they turn two, and your whole world begins to collapse. Unmet expectation is the root of all heartache. This is not the Palm Sunday we expected. When we think of Palm Sunday, we expect to be holding palm branches. We expect to be worshiping in a sanctuary. We expect to be celebrating the beginning of our Holy Week. We don't expect to be worshiping at home. I expected to be doing a series, finishing a prayer sermon series on prayers of adoration. Prayers in which we glorify, adore, and admire God. But it is very hard to pray those sorts of prayers when God didn't do what we expected. It's like trying to affirm your spouse when they do the exact opposite of what you expect. Or like trying to talk about how great a trip you had when it was a disappointment. It's hard to praise and thank and glorify God when he hasn't met our expectations. And perhaps this pandemic season, he has it for you. Perhaps as a first year college student, having to come home in the middle of your freshman year, or a graduating senior looking forward to graduation, being at home instead of celebrating with your friends wasn't what you expected. Perhaps you've been making significant conquering of sin habits in your life, and now God has you right back in the worst possible place, stuck in a cycle of isolation and depression, succumbing to addiction again. Maybe you thought you were finally getting your feet under you with community or with your relationship with God or your church family, and now here we are, separated from one another, wondering what will happen next. In a season where God hasn't seemed to meet our expectations, prayers of adoration are very difficult to pray. But they are also very crucial to pray. 
Because as we remember Jesus triumphantly entering the city of Jerusalem this Palm Sunday, we will see a group of people praising him and celebrating him that just a few chapters later turn on him. And as we explore what this passage has to teach us today about Jesus and about our expectations of Jesus, we might just learn why it's so important to praise him even when we don't want to even when he hasn't done what we want. Janice read John chapter 12, verses 12 through 19. I encourage you to follow along with me in your Bibles as we explore this passage today and examine those two ideas. What does this passage tell us about Jesus? And what does it tell us about our expectations of him? And how can it inform us to worship Jesus on this unexpected Palm Sunday? The first thing we learn about is about Jesus. In verses 12 and 13 of John chapter 12, Jesus enters the city of Jerusalem and the crowd goes wild. They're breaking out palm fronds to welcome him. They're quoting a psalm, Psalm 118, singing, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, blessed is the King of Israel. Now, we're so familiar with this Palm Sunday scene that we often neglect to realize just what's going on here. When the people are breaking out the palm branches, they're breaking out a nationalistic military symbol. Palm branches were what the people of the, uh, what the Jewish people welcomed back their uh, revolting ruler, Judas Maccabeus, when he came back from a significant victory against the Romans. Or rather, it might have been Simon Maccabeus. I need to get my Maccabees straight because I don't know my Apocrypha as well. But nonetheless, one of the Maccabee rulers came back from a great victory against the Romans. They broke out the palm fronds. Palm fronds were what the Jews celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles with. Palm fronds show up in Revelation 7 as a symbol of victory. Palm fronds were stamped on the coins of the time of the Maccabean Revolt. A palm branch symbolized victory, military, nationalistic victory. So when the Jews break these out, when Jesus is coming in, they're saying this is a time of military and nationalistic victory. Not only that, Not only do we have the nationalistic component, but we have a spiritual component. Because in verse 13, the Jews are quoting Psalm 118. That psalm was one that was sung frequently at the time of the Passover. It was a very spiritual psalm because it contained the only Hebrew occurrence of the word Hosanna. Save us now. As the Jews would plead at Passover, God, save us now, the very next verse of the psalm, verse 25, was, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. What doesn't appear in the psalm is this third call of the Jews. Blessed is the king of Israel. What that means is the Jews are looking back at Psalm 118, this spiritual psalm. They always sing the worship God, and they're saying, and it's happening now. This is our military king. This is our ruler. This is the promised Messiah who's going to make things right again. This is our king. And what does Jesus do? Humble Jesus who would never take the praise of the people but would hide in isolated places. Jesus eats it up. In Luke, we're we're told that when the Pharisees criticized Jesus for his disciples making these calls, Jesus says if they were quiet, the very stones would cry out. That's kind of prideful. The rocks would yell that I'm their king. How could that happen? But Jesus doesn't only allow people to make a claim about him. We see in verse 14, Jesus makes a claim about himself. Because in verse 14, we're told Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it, as it is written. And then a passage from Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 is quoted. Do not fear, daughter of Zion, for your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Jesus knew his Bible. 
And he knew when he went out of his way to find a donkey and ride in on it, he was making the claim, that passage back in Zechariah, that's me. I'm the king riding on the donkey. Jesus is making a claim, and the people are making a claim. The image is like that of a presidential inauguration ceremony. On the one hand, you have the president, who's making the oath of office, swearing on the Bible. Sorry, that's my right hand. That's why I'm not president. I'm a pastor. Um, swearing on the Bible and taking the oath of office. Or maybe he raises the right hand. I, I can't. Thankfully, I didn't have to do any of that when I became a pastor. But nonetheless, the president is making a claim to being the president. And the people waving their American flags as if they were palm branches are agreeing, yes, that is our president. The people make a claim. The president makes a claim. That's what's happening here. What we learn, the very first part of this main idea of the sermon, is Jesus is the king. <laughs> Surprise! None of you knew that, that Jesus is king, and that's what the triumphal entry is about. Tell us something we don't know, Pastor Steve. But do we act like he's the king? We know he's king. Of course he's king. We sing about him being king all the time. But do we really act like Jesus is our king? A mentor of mine in Dubai released a video this past week, uh, and he gave a sermon speaking into the coronavirus and noted that the etymology of the coronavirus, the word corona, comes from the Greek word for crown. You hear it in coronation ceremonies. The virus has a halo around it or a crown in the structure of the virus, thus the coronavirus the crowned virus. And as a king virus, this virus has its way of revealing to us who our king really is. Maybe it's shown you that you really worship king finances because as the unemployment checks aren't coming in and as you wonder what's going to happen next with your job, your time of worship is cast aside, focused on time of anxiety trying to pull your finances together. Maybe you've learned you worship king health as you sanitize every surface you've ever known existed and as you anxiously worry and chew your nails, wondering what's going to happen with this virus and then realizing the virus hides under your nails so you brush your teeth because you chewed your nails, but then you have to Lysol your sink. I'm not saying it's foolish to sanitize. We should take it seriously. But this virus has a way of revealing who our king really is what we spend the most time on, what consumes most of our mind, and what matters most to us. And King Jesus takes the back seats. Your pastor found out that he worships king competency. King, I want to look like I know what I'm doing to have these put together online sermons, to have a good looking online service, to have people affirm me, to go home at the end of the day and feel like I'm doing a good job and I'm a good pastor. I worship king competency because I'd rather make sure I feel good about the pastor I am and others feel good about the pastor I am than whether Jesus approves of the pastor I am. Who has this virus revealed to you that your king is? Has your spiritual life taken a back seat? Has the commandments of Jesus, like the Great Commission to go and make disciples of all nations and to share your faith with people, has that become the great suggestion? Have your sinful habits cropped back up because Jesus has gone back to the back seats? Is Jesus truly your king? Because if he is, then the Psalms tell us and John tells us that he's worthy of praise of all our praise, of all our worship, of all our glory, even when it doesn't feel right, even when he doesn't seem to meet our expectations, because he's worthy of our praise, because he is our king. He's worthy of our words, and he's worthy of our deeds. But so often we find ourselves, though we know that's true, falling back into old habits. Jesus takes the back seat. How do we counter that? How do we avoid that? Why does that happen? I think that's what we see in the second part of this story. Because in the second part of the story, we learn a whole lot about expectation. 
we see three different groups with three different responses to Jesus. The first is his disciples. In verse 16, we're told the disciples at first didn't understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. To the disciples, they knew Jesus was something or someone, but their expectations were too small. They followed Jesus, they walked with Jesus, but consistently throughout the gospel, they were surprised when they learned they're supposed to forgive people 70 times seven, not just seven times. When they learned Jesus was going to die and rise again, not just bring a new kingdom to Israel. Constantly, they were blown away, even though they spent a lot of close time with Jesus, because they didn't realize how small their expectations were. Believe it or not, this is a danger you and I are prevalent to. You and I are prevalent to the same danger of the disciples of having small expectations because we're so comfortable with Jesus, familiar with Jesus, that sometimes we forget what he demands. The disciples could sometimes treat Jesus as sort of a figurehead of a king. Oh yeah, we'll worship him, we believe in him, but does he really own all of our lives? Does he really ask for everything? Is he really going to do what he says he's going to do? Perhaps this time, this pandemic that's slowing us down and making us refocus, perhaps it's an opportunity for us to examine if our expectations of Jesus are too small. If we're too prone to go to church and, like a friend of mine once shared the joke with me, we might go to church and sit in an empty lot for an hour and feel like we've done our job. Come sit in this empty sanctuary with nobody here and say, well, I went to church. But these past couple of weeks have maybe shown us that church is a little bigger than sitting in a building. It means calling one another, praying for one another, caring for one another, sharing our faith with those who do not know. Jesus' expectations don't stop when the world seems to stop spinning. Us Christians are not on vacation. Have we, perhaps, made Jesus a figurehead king? The next group that we see is that of the crowd. And the crowd we were told about in verses 17 and 18. The crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard he had given this miraculous sign, went out to meet him. We're told often throughout John that the crowds flocked around Jesus when he performed miracles. And that's not a bad thing. But the danger we see is when the crowd makes the expectation of Jesus too big. Now, you can't make expectations of Jesus too big, but you can focus on the wrong area of life and make those expectations too big. An example is in John chapter 6. After the feeding of the 5,000, the disciples or the crowd shows up to Jesus again. And Jesus says, I tell you the truth, you're not here because of the miracle I performed, but because you had your fill of bread. You came back for the blessings. See, here the crowd is expecting something of Jesus. The military, nationalistic, palm frond, psalm display is very clear. Throughout the Old Testament, the promised Messiah had a military connotation. He will come and free us from exile. He'll defeat our enemies. He'll raise us up to be the kingdom we once were. So when they see Jesus marching in, their expectation is he is going to boot out the Romans and make Israel what it was before. Now, the military expectation wasn't totally wrong. One day, Jesus will come again in glory with a sword coming out of his mouth, judging the nations, remaking the world, but their expectations were focused on the wrong thing at the wrong time. They expected only the military blessings and not the spiritual blessings Jesus would bring. Larry Crabb, an author, focuses on this tendency in Christianity today to focus on the old way rather than the new way. The old way, he says, is to focus on worshiping and following Jesus because if we do things the right way, we'll get his blessings. 
If I raise my kids according to the Bible, they'll turn out all right. If I go to church on Sundays, God will bless me. If I give financially, I will thrive financially. It's a this for that, a trade-off. It's a tendency that you and I are prone to fall into, to think, God, if I scratch your back, you'll scratch mine. But I remember being blown away by one testimony of a friend I heard back in college. A testimony she shared of how one day, when she had been struggling throughout her life with terrible migraines, God finally healed her from them. But she also said in that moment, countering every expectation that, well, God healed me, so therefore he's good. God restored me, so therefore he's good. No, she said, God still would have been good even if he didn't heal my migraines. See, often like the crowd, we can make our praise of Jesus dependent on circumstances. But we must learn to instead make our praise not because of circumstances, but because of Jesus' identity. Even if Jesus doesn't do what we want, he's worthy of being praised. That's the second big idea that we see. Jesus is king, so he's worthy of praise, and he's worthy of praise even when he doesn't do what we want. We see it show up in this final character, the third character, the Pharisees, because they say to one another, see, the whole world has gone after him. This is getting us nowhere. To the Pharisees, Jesus had failed their expectations. Because we read back in John 11, John chapter 11, verse 48, that they feared the whole world would go after Jesus and the Romans would take away their place and their nation. Now, the Messiah was the very one that would restore the Jews to their nation. So the Pharisees and the religious leaders have already concluded this Jesus, he's not who we thought he was. They've already concluded he hasn't met their expectations. I remember I was reading through a book on hiking through the Appalachian Trail, and I was so excited to get to the chapter when this author was going to arrive at one of my all-time favorite hikes, the Franconia Ridge Loop in New Hampshire. I was excited to read of his impressions of his experiences, and then he got there, and it was rainy and cloudy and windy, and he wrote about it being one of the worst parts of his hike, and he just plowed through and carried on. And I found myself saying, oh, no, if only you'd stayed. If only you'd waited for the beautiful views on that ridge. But because it didn't meet his expectations, he just moved right along. Now, you and I might not think we're prone to be Pharisees. But we are prone to make that same mistake. To conclude that Jesus isn't really who he says he is. Because he hasn't met the expectations that we thought he had. Expectations like Jesus You told me to go share my faith, and I tried, and nobody responded, so clearly you're not really going to be with me when I do it. Jesus, I've been praying for 20 years for somebody to be saved. I've been praying for 20 years for their health to come back, for my family to be restored, and it's not happening. So I don't really know if I believe in that power of prayer. We fall into the Pharisee trap whenever we assume that Jesus has failed our expectations. Which of these characters might you identify with today? The disciple who has a figurehead king that says, yeah, I'll follow and worship Jesus, but doesn't really have expectations of him? The crowd which has a benevolent king. If I do what he wants, he'll cover me with blessings. Or the Pharisee who has a failed king. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll go to church, I'll worship Jesus, but I don't really think he's going to do anything. How do we counter those temptations? How do we battle against them and take ownership of believing Jesus is the king he says he is? Of believing he really is the king who can and will and wants to intervene? Well, we do what we see in the next two verses. When we're told in John 12, 20, that some Greeks, Greeks who weren't Jews, didn't know the Old Testament, didn't know about Jesus, but they came to the disciples and said, Sirs, We want to see Jesus. And to these men, Jesus responds, Now the time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified.
when we tend to set our expectations, the problem isn't that Jesus doesn't meet expectations, it's that we set the wrong expectations. Like the Greeks, let us make the effort to come and see Jesus and let him set the expectations. Because when he sets the expectations, they never fail. That's why martyrs on their deathbeds and Paul waiting in prison to be, to be killed himself and all the saints that go before us can worship Jesus with their lives in shambles because they know he will not fail the expectation of giving them a new eternal life. That he will not fail the expectation of coming back and making all things new. How might we see Jesus this week? Well, it may be by focusing on his cross. Because Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians that that cross, well, it's foolishness to the Greeks. What kind of king would choose a cross for a throne, riding a donkey, an animal of peace, rather than a horse, an animal of war? And it's a stumbling block to Jews. Wait, this isn't the guy we thought he was going to be. He didn't give us what we wanted. But Paul says that cross to those who are being saved, it's the power of God and the wisdom of God. This week, we're going to live stream a communion service on Maundy Thursday at 7 o'clock p.m. to remember Jesus' sacrifice for us. And on Good Friday, you're invited to also take some time to just meditate in the middle of the day, to look at the story of that cross in the Gospels, to remember that very Jesus who went before us, that cross that... To the Jew, it's a symbol of a stumbling block. To the Greek, it's foolishness. To the disciple, it's a mystery. To the crowd, it's just maybe one of many great things. And to the Pharisee, it's a relic. But to us, to us, it is the power and wisdom of God. Look to see that cross this week. Dwell on that cross. Remember what Jesus did on it. Remember that though he knew he'd be crucified on it, though he knew the crowd singing Hosanna on Sunday would say crucify on Friday, he still came to Jerusalem. Maybe it's not that Jesus has failed our expectations. Maybe we've set the wrong expectations. Maybe this week you can explore the discussion questions for the sermon below. You can process with a friend or family member whether you set expectations of God. Blessings on earth, spiritual blessings, or scratch your back, you scratch mine theology. And maybe examine whether instead he has expectations for you. To share his good news. To live a life that's holy and honoring of him. But to also remember that at the end of the day, the message of that cross reminds us that even when we set the wrong expectations, even when you and I go from Hosanna to crucify on Friday, that Sunday is coming, that Jesus does and will rise again, and that even when we fall short and forget he is king and make someone or something else king, he does still reign on the throne. So this week, as we remember to stare at the cross throughout our Holy Week, as we seek to live a faithful life in response, let us remember that Jesus is our King. And because he's our King, he is worthy of our praise, even when he doesn't do what we want. Amen.